G'day everyone. I always feel sorry for Australians when that, that mention of the underarm gets thrown up. I mean, it's, you know, it's at least 35 years, two months. <laughs> Three days. Um, it was 5.43pm on Sunday the 1st of February 1981 that there was an indelible stain put on the whole of the Australian population forever. Um, but I'm assuming there's no Australians here today, no. Um, it's fun to be here. Um, firstly, just as a, as a lay person, um, I just wanted to say something um, to bore you up. Um, not to bore you, but to buoy you up. Um, you are in a really hard uh, industry, a really hard profession. Um, you get knocked about a lot. Um, both externally and sometimes internally. Um, my uh, family involvement with, the, with New Zealand's health sector over long periods of time has been um, almost always fantastic, starting from the time when mum got pregnant with me and dad had a heart attack. Um, <laughs> and he became the first guy in New Zealand to have the use and aid of an oxygen tent um, and then was put on a trial of warfarin, uh, blood thinning. Um, and really, from that point on in my life, um, just about all of my experiences with, with those people that have helped me and, and my family, wider family, um, in health have been terrific. So a help, heartfelt thank you to all of you. I know it's, it, it's not just a job. Um, it is a profession, but for so many people, um, it's a vocation. It's something that you absolutely dedicate yourself to. Um, so good on you. Um, what's also been interesting, just listening to um, Mr Marsh and, uh, and others this morning, is, is just the degree of complexity and difficulty that exists in terms of trying to grapple with the challenges of what's in front of you. Um, and to adapt, you know, Chai gave a, a number of startling statistics about um, the changing world, and, and we all know this. Um, we've only got to look at our kids to realise um, how much things are changing so quickly in their lives, and therefore for us, um, and how it is that, that we try and keep up with this and sometimes get ahead of the, the eight ball. Um, and so, to spend a day just thinking about leadership um, and about teamwork, and in my mind, those two things cannot be separated. They, they fit together hand and glove. Um, and then listening to Henry as he just described the evolution in England of, of, uh, of how leadership has moved from, I think, perhaps without putting words in his mouth, a, a, a dictatorial situation led by the, the surgeon to uh, a, a leadership model now that is needing to allow others to take really key leadership roles. Um, a gentle observation is that, that um, Henry may be a little bit dismissive of the role that management can play in that. Uh, in my mind, and, and you just heard the minister talk about a concept of one team, you do have to clarify what the team is. And, you know, I've had to do this in, in the jobs that I've been involved in and, and a simple example of, of the, the tensions that exist that are, that are that's synonymous with what you guys are, are looking at is, is just simply the All Blacks. You have uh, the coach of the All Blacks, Steve Hansen, you've had a, a fantastic captain in Richie McCaw, but you've also got a very competent, skillful chief executive of New Zealand Rugby in Steve Chu. Um, who's in charge of this? Um, that is always a, a challenge. Now, they, between those three really top leaders, um, have spent a lot of time on and have actually found out the answers that work for them. I sense, again, just listening this morning um, to what's been said, is that that challenge is always in front of, of your industry, your organisations, is who's actually in charge here. I know today we're, we're concentrating on, on clinical leadership, um, but actually I think the one team concept goes much wider than that, and it's really important that that's embraced and that there is honest discussion about um, 
who is actually in charge, what are the roles and responsibilities, um, who's accountable, and how is all of that going to be pieced together. When I look at these sorts of things, I always revert to thinking about a jigsaw puzzle. How do you fit the jigsaw puzzle together so that ultimately all of those pieces actually fit and you can see the end result quite clearly, as opposed to um, what most of my attempts at doing jigsaw puzzles have been, which is you end up getting a piece of scissors and cutting off bits and pieces in order to fit it in place and you're still left with about 10 pieces that you don't know what to do with, so you just put them in the bin and hide them. Um, I, I want to use the Rugby World Cup example today um, just to further demonstrate some of the points I want to talk about. Um, you know, I, I, I'd warn you, I'm not about to lecture you about rugby or sport or cricket. Um, uh, I just want to use it because I think it's an example of something that New Zealand got itself involved in in 2011, that people from all walks of life had some experience of, sometimes for the better, maybe occasionally for the worse. Um, but people actually know what I'm talking about, and, and I'd prefer to use examples that people have some degree of familiarity with and delve off into some of the other areas like boxing that I'm involved in that surgeons don't want me talking about. Um, but I'll just get Pierce um, now just to take us back to about 2011, this, this event that captured New Zealand for a 45-day period, um, and just a little bit of a montage to get us back in the mood of it. Um, there was a slight bit of relief felt in New Zealand at the end of that last <laughs> game after we absolutely trounced the French in the final. Um, who went to a game? That's a lot. Who watched it on telly? Is there many here that didn't do either? <laughs> no accounting for taste. Um, <laughs> what were the highlights? What do you remember? of those 45 days in New Zealand? Energy. Energy. Price. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's Liz Price. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll give you just some examples of the things that I remember. Uh, we'd been planning for this thing for, for five years um, to create an overnight sensation. Um, and just before the start of the tournament, the 20 teams, or 19 of them, started coming into New Zealand and we were ensuring that each of them were getting really warm welcomes as they arrived. The last of the teams to arrive was the Tongan team. Um, they arrived at Auckland Airport on a, a Monday afternoon at about 4 o'clock. We'd been working with the Tongan community, which is a fairly sizable community in Auckland, to get them behind them and look after their team. And that Monday afternoon, about 7,000 Tongan supporters went out to Auckland Airport um, to welcome their team. Um, there weren't a lot of parks available, so um, a lot of them chose to park their cars on the southern motorway at peak hour time. Um, now, um, you know, I had a lot of really talented people working within our one team, um, traffic managers and risk managers, and not one of the buggers had actually identified the risk of Tongan supporters parking on... Uh, <laughs> Southern Motorway at 4 p.m. on a peak hour traffic time. Um, but, but that moment started to capture people's imagination and you saw the colours come out, um, you saw the pride of the Tongan community as the day before we'd seen the, the pride of the Samoan community when their team arrived. When you drove into the city from Auckland Airport, you saw the colours across people's houses and their, their fences and everything like that. I mean, just that short montage, the, the thing that continually strikes me about that is colour, 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 different countries, the colours, the diversity um, that came through in the opportunity to host that event. Um, then we went to the opening ceremony and there was just a, a short clip of it and, and on the opening night, to have 25 minutes to produce something that captured the imagination of not only the 20, 60,000 people that were inside Eden Park that night, uh, but uh, an audience of 60 million around the world. Um, that was the first impression they were going to get of New Zealand as hosts of, of this big event. That was the moment that it really was going to count, um, and we had to get that dead right, and, and my sense is that we did. And then a week later to go back to Eden Park and the stadium for a match between Ireland and Australia, um, the third biggest crowd that had ever attended a rugby match in New Zealand's history and the All Blacks weren't even playing. 
Um, and what we had done over, over so long to try and get people to recognise the importance of supporting everyone in this tournament, not just our team, one way was wear the colours of the team. And that night, it was just, it was fantastic to watch so many people, you know, hundreds and hundreds wearing the yellow of the Wallabies and 55,000 were Edemo Green of <laughs> Ireland. Um, and at the end of a, a match which resulted in a really historic upset victory for the Irish and the Sky television commentators running on, grabbing hold of the Irish captain, Brian O'Driscoll, and, and after a lot of thought, asking a really incisive question, how do you feel? And, <laughs> and Brian looking up at, at the stands and, and saying, I'm just so grateful to all those people that have, that have made the trip across from Dublin. And I'm thinking most of them are from Takapuna and Papatoi. And, <laughs> and yep, they've, they've put on your shirt tonight, but the next night they're going to put on Liz's shirt and put on the Welsh. And that's what happened over that period of time. Um, there, was, there was lovely moments where you knew you had got inside the heart of, of the country, where I did a lot of driving during the pool phase of the tournament. At one stage, um, you, using GPS, I got lost going from... Rotorua to, uh, to New Plymouth and ended up in a little country town called Bennydale. Anyone heard of Bennydale? One street, three shops, population 12. Um, hanging off each lamppost was a hand-painted mural, each of them specifically designed for a team in the tournament, 20 different hand-painted murals hang, hang, hanging off the lampposts. The three shops covered in the flags of, of each of the 20 teams plus the All Blacks. Um, you just felt really then that, that you know, this, this was an event that had really, as I said, got inside the hearts of New Zealanders. Ended up in Palmerston North a few days later watching a match there. Um, one of the challenges we had in that tournament was how we were going to get people excited, not just about the big games, but about the small games. And, and um, Palmerston North were hosting their first game of, of the Rugby World Cup, um, a really big game between Romania and Georgia. Now, um, Palmerston North is the home of the Manawatu rugby team. The Manawatu rugby team plays in green. Um, the students of Massey University established a tradition uh, a few years ago of going along to support Manawatu and wearing green buckets on their heads when they did this. Um, I'm not sure why, but it's, it's apparently really exciting in Palmy to do this. Um, so a couple of days before this match between Romania and Georgia, John O'Nailer, who's the, the mayor, or was the mayor of Palmy, he's now MP, um, grabbed hold of the district mayors around and he said, right, oh, our city will look after um, Romania. The rest of you, you're in charge of looking after Georgia, your fans. The mayors between them went out and bought 8,000 buckets, 4,000 red, 4,000 green, and handed it out to the, to the people coming into the stadia. Um, it's only a small stadia, only holds about 12,000 people. I was there that night and I was looking down and I was thinking, what must it be like? You're sitting on the other side of the world, the alarm clock goes off, you turn on TV to watch Rugby World Cup, the cameras pan the crowd and everyone's sitting there in buckets. <laughs> probably think, oh, all right, tonight's in Palmerston North, and get on with it. <laughs> but it was those sort of little things um, that happened that enabled communities everywhere around New Zealand in lots of ways to put what I refer to as a unique thumbprint of their own on the overall um, success of the event. Um, that only occurred because of, of the work that had gone in beforehand in the four years or so, creating the event, gradually nurturing and building the event over a period of time. Gradually that one team becoming wider and wider and encompassing more and more participants in that team and somehow finding a way that the communication uh, that existed uh, enabled or was in the, in the uh, minds of the recipients of those communications gave them the licence to make a contribution to uh, the outcome of an event that ultimately, when you put all of those individual contributions together, uh, resulted in a, in a really powerful force that I think most people um, regard as being um, pretty successful. But when we started out on this journey, the, the event itself happened in, in 2011. Um, 
the story actually began in, in 2005 when New Zealand Rugby um, had the, the uh, courage to, to stand up and go for the rights against the odds um, and they weren't expected to succeed. Um, they came up with a lovely story at the time about a stadium of four million turning a rugby mad country into effectively a, a stadium of four million people within which this event would be held. Um, and they ultimately succeeded uh, in getting this. But, but people forget now the challenges that were being faced at that time. Um, because in effect, the rugby world isn't in New Zealand. We might like to think it is, but it's actually mainly based on the other side of the world. So when we, when we secured the rights as a real upset, I think it's, it's fair to, to summarise the reaction of the British media as being um, New Zealand's too small, uh, too isolated, uh, we're too obsessed with the, the All Blacks and our people are too boring. This event will be a disaster. Um, I don't think I'm being uh, misrepresenting or that unkind and actually summarising it that way. Um, but it, that was a lovely piece of motivation that I kept in front of the team that we built as we, as we embarked on this program of building uh, an event that actually would deal to some of those issues, because actually some of those issues were dead right, dead true. Um, there are times when we've got far too obsessed with, with the All Blacks. We are small and isolated, obviously, geographically, and sometimes that affects our mindset about things. Um, we're not that boring, but we always have the opportunity to make ourselves more interesting, and this was an opportunity we needed to take to make sure that we did. So uh, it was about actually fronting up to those sorts of challenges. There were other challenges that we had. The, the financial hosting model for a Rugby World Cup is horrendous. In essence, the way it goes is, is like this. The International Rugby Board owns all of the rights. It will keep all of the sponsorship money, a few hundred million. Um, keep all of the broadcasting rights, a few hundred million. Uh, all the merchandising rights. Uh, the host country, you will pay for everything uh, to do with the running of uh, 20 teams and 48 matches, and that'll cost you about 300 and something million. Um, and you can keep the gate takings from the matches, which prior to the Rugby World Cup, the, the highest ever amount grossed from, from any event in New Zealand um, was about 24 million. So that was really going to offset against 300 million or so. Um, so we had quite a quite an amazing uh, sort of financial challenge in front of us as well as, as well as dealing with the other things. But what we also recognised is that we had a whole lot going for us. Um, New Zealand is really interested in rugby and in lots of places around the world it's probably regarded as the spiritual home of rugby. Being small um, is and can be a disadvantage, but if you look at it the right way, it can be a huge advantage, and I think this is something that New Zealand has done really well over the years in lots of different ways of, of our life, is that we've turned that smallness into an advantage. Um, it's much easier to, to be connected and to stay connected as a, as a nation when you are small and when you are an island nation. Um, there was a, a strong, strong level of support in behind us from, from the rugby community, from the government, and from a lot of other uh, areas of New Zealand business and New Zealand life, uh, all of whom were prepared to recognise that this was a golden opportunity for New Zealand and that for us to, to really take advantage of it, um, there had to be that, that strong support throughout. Um, for me, when I looked at it four years beforehand, um, and in the context of what we're talking about today in terms of leadership and, and teamwork, um, I looked at the matrix of, of people and organisations that we knew we were going to have to deal with really closely to establish relationships and, and partnerships that, that all came together to work. Um, you know, just at one stage, I think we counted up, we were dealing with something like 26 government agencies. We were dealing with local authorities from all over New Zealand. We were dealing with about 20 rugby unions, about um, 15 or so stadiums around New Zealand, and a multitude of other uh, business organisations that were going to be needed to help piece this, this whole thing together. Um, in my mind, uh, I saw that as the greatest opportunity we had, that if we could go about turning that mass of 
uh, interested parties, um, not just interested in the sense that they were interested in it doing well, but actually they had uh, a business imperative or a, or a sporting imperative for it to go well. If we could turn that into some form of uh, cohesive for a type of teamwork, then the impact of that would be so much greater because if we didn't achieve that, then the alternative we were facing was um, dealing with a whole bunch of organisations that were uh, separate from us, territorial, protectionist, fragmented, and dealing with everyone would just be an absolute nightmare. So um, it was absolutely vital that somehow we came up with a formula that enabled this teamwork to be created, and created in a way that actually people didn't feel just duty bound to be part of, but actually that they really wanted to and that they got immense satisfaction out of being part of. Um, so again, just, just thinking of the context of, of what we're talking about today, um, if I just concentrate a little bit for the moment on, on going about building the team, um, the wider team, uh, for me, the, the starting point was to have a story um, that uh, was something that people could understand, uh, that's something that people would look at and say, actually, I believe that story, that's authentic, um, I, can, I can get it, it applies to what it is that's in front of us. Um, I use the word story, lots of, lots of people sort of use words like strategy, um, I, don't, I try and steer clear of that. For me, I like to bring it a lot closer home, a lot more personal, and, and therefore refer to it as a story. And although you might look at me and say, well, you know, you've got a Rugby World Cup there, it's a lot easier for you to sit down and think up a story um, about a Rugby World Cup um, than it is for, for you and your various parts of, of the health industry to think about uh, what your story is, I think, no, that's wrong. In my experience, and I've had quite a bit across different, different parts of our society, there is a story sitting there to be formed everywhere you are, no matter what you're involved in. Um, it requires a lot of thought, a lot of consultation and collaboration, um, but ultimately there is something truly good and authentic that sits there to be articulated and then embraced and used um, uh, by your organisation, by your team, by your industry. You know, I tested this out on the tourism industry um, uh, two or three years ago where I worked in tourism for a while and my, my sole role was to build their story. Um, and ultimately, we built a story. Um, about the tourism industry and, and nothing is more fragmented in New Zealand than tourism because ultimately tourism isn't a sector, isn't an industry, it's just a whole bunch of different things that ultimately get cobbled together that visitors have something to do with. Um, trying to, to get the people involved in that to buy into the concept of a story was really difficult but ultimately in the end um, they did and it's been a story that the industry and tourism has actually embraced and now it's, it's going through great times. And the great thing about now, where it's going through some of its best times ever, it actually has a ready-made story that it can stand up and, and tell its people and tell others about. So I am a great believer, and this is what we did with Rugby World Cup, but I mentioned it before that, that when the rugby union got the rights in 2005, they started the story. Um, and that story was aimed at the people who were going to be voting on who was going to get the 2011 Rugby World Cup. So the story they told was a rugby story. It was about the fact New Zealand is a rugby mad country, we will turn ourselves into a rugby stadium, bring your Rugby World Cup tournament to New Zealand and we will give you a, a, a rugby experience you cannot get anywhere else. That was a great story to tell for a bid process. It was never going to be the story of Rugby World Cup in New Zealand, and I'll explain why. Um, rugby is of interest to, to a lot of New Zealanders. All the research shows somewhere between 40, 50, 60 percent of New Zealanders have some degree of interest in, in rugby. But there's a really large percentage of people who don't. Um, 
and there's actually a percentage of people who hate the game. Um, and if we were going to take the opportunity as hosts of a major event to have that event embraced by the whole of a country, we could not come up with a story that actually straight away alienated you know, 20, 30, 40% of the population. We had to evolve what was a really good starting point for a story into something that ultimately people could, could see an attachment to, see ownership of, and actually be inspired enough by to actually get in and, and uh, make a contribution to uh, that story and, and turning perception into reality. Um, and so there was an evolution of that story that went on over a period of, of four years. The rugby community was the easy part, getting them interested in the Rugby World Cup story. But then we had to get communities interested. So it then became about explaining to communities that this was a, a major, major event. We have never, ever hosted anything like this before. It was going to be an opportunity for all sorts of communities around New Zealand to have some time in the sun um, for them to actually shine. So it didn't have to be about rugby. It could be about their communities because there were going to be so many visitors coming to New Zealand and so many visitors moving around the country that there would be a spotlight on various communities from time to time. So we were inviting those individual communities to then participate in that. And then we switched our attention to evolving it further to um, international fans and saying, you know, we know that it's likely at some point New Zealand's on your bucket list. Now, here is an opportunity uh, to come to New Zealand, use the Rugby World Cup as a, as a total excuse for coming and having a great time in our country. So there was a whole bunch of people there that we had to keep evolving the story to um, well beyond the rugby concept. Then we had to get females and kids really attracted to us because all of the research firstly about females was showing us that, that actually whilst every you know, two and three, every two males out of three were interested in rugby, um, only one in three females were interested in rugby. And, and it was always my belief um, that if we were going to succeed in making this tournament vibrant and interesting and creative, uh, we needed far more females than males. Um, that wasn't a view necessarily that was wholeheartedly accepted by the rugby community, um, but in, in my mind and, and ultimately in the mind of our, of our organisation, it was absolutely vital to secure strong female support right across the whole spectrum of, of uh, how this tournament was going to be created and delivered. And with the kids, you know, uh, what we did is we worked with the Ministry of Education for three years. We came up with uh, we, we realised that Rugby World Cup could be used as a, as a mechanism for teaching geography, history, mathematics, English, the works really. And so we came up with a curriculum uh, that uh, suited kids of all ages between 5 and, and 12. And, and um, about two months before the start of the World Cup, we arranged for about 500,000 resources to be delivered out with the te teaching resources with them. Um, and you know what it's like when your kids are working on a school project. They bring it home and eventually the whole family is working on the success of that school project. Everyone wants to get an A from, from the, the year four teacher. Um, and we banked on that. And that, of course, that's exactly what happened, is these kids took home these Rugby World Cup projects and it just infected and excited uh, their families. So, again, just broadening and broadening. And then we had to take it to the ultimate... Um, broaden of the story, which was that um, uh, we had to, to realise that our role in hosting Rugby World Cup 2011 was hosting. It wasn't about setting up a mechanism for the All Blacks to win the World Cup for the first time in 24 years. It actually was about hosting all sorts of people that were going to be coming to this event, 20 teams, uh, their, their media, their fans. Um, we were, we were only going to get one chance to host the Rugby World Cup. I don't know whether we'll ever do it again. Um, on the rugby field, the All Blacks will get a chance every four years, and you know we know the last two times they've nailed it. Um, but don't remember, uh, don't forget, we were planning in 2008, 9, 10, when they hadn't won it for 24 years. Um, for us, the message was New Zealand, you know, 
stand up and be hosts, look after these people, make it fun. So again, the story kept evolving to the point where it became about a stadium of four million hosts. So the point I guess I'm making is that um, if you are establishing, setting out to, to create strong, vibrant, really interactive, really effective teamwork, start with a really great story that people look at and are really proud of and that they buy into, they know it's true, and that they see a way for themselves to get involved in to actually turn it from perception and into reality. And as I said, I think you can do that in any part of, of uh, whatever job or whatever part of life you're living in. The second thing about creating that teamwork was about the, the importance, the vital importance of, of taking a lead in creating great partnerships and great relationships. Now, you know, if anyone ever writes up something on the board about that, of course they're going to say that. Um, like just about everything else that, that Henry or me or Chai or anyone else is talking about today, a lot of it is, is really simple to write down. The hard part is actually bringing it to life in the way that it's meant to be brought to life. So I can't stand up here and provide you with magic recipes about this stuff. Um, I can just in lots of ways reiterate the basics and say understand the basics, get them dead right and surely great relationships and great partnerships are at the heart of, of everything. Um, and a couple of examples where this really mattered to us in the Rugby World Cup were, were these. Firstly, I mentioned about the financial model of Rugby World Cup. We were effectively creating and running this tournament as agents for the International Rugby Board that were situated in Dublin. Um, we were no more than agents, no more than servants. Um, if we had a relationship with the IRB that actually was genuinely exercised as a master-servant relationship, then that would have stunted the ability, our ability to actually go about creating something really special in an enormous way. And we recognised this early on and we said to them, listen, we know you've got all the rights, you know, all the contracts say you can do whatever you like and we just have to get on and, and obey you. Um, but how about we put the contract aside and we actually look at this as a genuine partnership and why don't we start by recognising the fact that there's a lot of distance between Dublin and Wellington where we were set up. Um, why don't you send your two best Rugby World Cup people across to live with us for three or four years while we go about building this? Guys that can actually, who have the experience of this from previous events, who can guide us, who can, who can give us encouragement, who can act as a really good communication link, facilitation link with, with the people back in Dublin, who can just hold our hands and get us through that. And at the same time, what we can offer is that, that we can help uh, the IRB through those two key people understand the environment that their event is walking into, understand the possibilities of how their event could be enhanced enormously by, um, by understanding what the locals could actually bring to us. They agreed to that. There's two guys that came out three years beforehand. They shifted their families out uh, into Wellington. They lived with us. We worked in the same office. Um, gradually, that team of two built up to about 12 or 13 by the time of the tournament. People who actually upended their lives came and lived with us in Wellington and lived in our business in Wellington. Um, we went through, there was enormous stresses and strains involved in, in preparing for and running a major event like the Rugby World Cup under the glare of so much publicity, including particularly in New Zealand. Um, that relationship uh, survived all of those stresses and strains um, because the strength of the relationships. Henry mentioned it before about the continuity of people that you work with and how, how you get through the hard times in business is, is often because the strength of the personal relationships underneath it are, are the foundation that enables you to find a solution. Well, that was exactly what it was like with the IRB. So having actually exhorted them to, to taking that approach and then, and then agreeing to do it and, and the fact is it went ahead and it worked, 
we then had to take exactly that same approach to the people we were dealing with around New Zealand because the same risk existed, the same risk of master-servant, because in that instance we were the ones holding all of the cards. We held the Rugby World Cup and we would dish the Rugby World Cup out to those who we felt worthy. Um, so if we were going to treat people like servants, then we were going to be, uh, we just weren't going to achieve the potential of those relationships. So we adopted the same approach there. Uh, we went to the regions and said, you know, this is not a rugby event. It's, it's an event for your community and it's an event for our country. Let's work out the best way of connecting. So what that resulted in in 2007, um, three years before the creation of the Super City in Auckland, was eight councils in Auckland, three rugby unions and three stadia coming together and forming a Rugby World Cup regional coordination group for Auckland that stayed together throughout the whole of that event that effectively gave us the ability to deal with one group and to not only um, work with them but to listen really carefully and to encourage them and ultimately, uh, you know, Auckland was one of our biggest risks when we looked at, at what could go wrong for Rugby World Cup. We felt that, that it was so big, so fragmented, so dysfunctional at times, particularly in a political sense, that it could cause us an absolute nightmare. Instead, uh, the relationship we developed with Auckland and the relationship they developed within the Auckland region became the greatest strength on which they built and delivered a fantastic slice of Rugby World Cup for their region. Um, but it's all very well to stand up and say, um, you know, we've got a great story and we've got great relationships. But the next step and the critical step that has to follow from that is that when you are making key decisions, those key decisions have to be absolutely consistent with what it is that you've been spouting on about in your story and when you're trying to build these great relationships and partnerships. So the best examples of that happened for us when we had to decide where the matches were going to go. And you can imagine that, that there was a desperation around some areas for Rugby World Cup matches to go there. But on the other side of the coin, there was this financial threat to us where we had to somehow generate uh, as close to 300 million bucks worth of gate ticket revenue as we could in order to try and help balance the books for the rugby union and the government who were, st who were liable for whatever the shortfall was. So we are under tremendous pressure from, from those two to get the best possible financial return out of whatever we did. And common sense would have said, well, to get the best financial return, you've got to take most of your matches to Auckland and, and Wellington and Christchurch. Um, but then how do you then do that on one hand and talk about a stadium of four million? Because in the end, really, if you do that, you're talking about a stadium of 2.5 million and the other 1.5 million can go to hell. So the decision we made at that time when we were allocating matches is that we had to ensure that these matches were spread around New Zealand as much as we possibly could um, so as to engage those communities and give them the opportunity to do ultimately what they did, which was to put their unique thumbprint on the success of the overall event. Um, the IRB uh, didn't like this. They, because of financial reasons, they didn't want us stressed. So they were trying to persuade us that we would only go to about seven or eight places around New Zealand. We worked out we needed to go to 13 places. So for months and months we argued about the fact we needed to go to 16 places and eventually we compromised at 13. Um, <laughs> But if you think, if you put a, a map of New Zealand in your mind's eye and you put red dots on where the, the matches were going, um, it was always obvious you'd be putting dots on Auckland and North Harbour and Wellington and Christchurch and Dunedin and, and uh, a couple of other places. But by getting um, permission, and we needed permission, it wasn't a decision we could take, we had to persuade others to go to 13 venues we then could put dots critically on Whangarei, uh, on Nelson, on Invercargill and on Palmerston North. Ultimately four regions that really created special little things that added to the beauty of Rugby World Cup. Then you started to look a lot more like a stadium of four million when you looked at where those dots existed. But then we got a stroke of luck. Um, these 20 teams in the Rugby World Cup, we had to look after them for, for a minimum of 35 days and, and the ones that lasted for 45 days. 
in our mind's eye, what, what we had planned to do is to have them uh, stationed in one base camp somewhere in New Zealand, and they would then travel out of that base camp for wherever their matches were, but they'd just travel out for a couple of days and then go back to base camp. We took that to the teams, and the team said, nah, too boring, keep us moving. Um, that was fantastic, because what that did is it opened up for us the opportunity to send these teams even further around New Zealand than those 13 dots that are on that map. And suddenly we were able to think about, okay, what are we gonna do with Romania? You know, a real powerhouse in rugby, household names that we all know. Um, <laughs> so we looked around New Zealand and we found um, a little Romanian expat community in Ashburton. And so we went down to Ashburton and said, well, how about you guys look after the Romanian team for a week? Yeah, we'll do that. And that happened, and it was fantastic. Um, we did the same thing with Georgia into the Wairarapa area, and they really put their arms around those guys. Um, we sent, imagine this is a juxtaposition, we sent Russia to Blenheim. Um, <laughs> And, and one of the loveliest things that was done was the, the uh, Marlborough District Council uh, changed all of their street, line, street signs. They translated them into Russian, all three of them. And, um, <laughs> which caused havoc for the four cars for, for a couple of days. <laughs> but it was just another little example of the way in which communities embraced this, saw the fun of it, saw the, the, the opportunity for them to shine and went ahead. In the end, um, we sent teams to 26 places around New Zealand. And when you, you, again, think of that map of New Zealand and the dots that are on it, suddenly you're putting dots on Ashburton, on, on Masterton, on Gisborne, on Whanganui, um, on Kerikeri, Kerry. uh, you know, just all over New Zealand. It was unbelievable. And suddenly you were giving communities all around New Zealand the opportunity and the responsibility uh, to contribute to the success of the event. Communities that never, ever would have thought that that was possible um, were being asked to stand up and do it. And they loved it, they took it on. They got quite scared about it, but they, they loved it. Um, so, so think about those lessons, but, but I think there was, a, there was a list put up this morning um, about some of the personal leadership qualities that uh, are important and I think there's one that's been mentioned two or three times this morning and I reiterate it completely. Leadership, when I started being a CEO, I didn't know anything about leadership and I thought leadership was about leading from the front and um, it was vitally important in certain circumstances, particularly times of crisis, to get out and lead from the front. But what I've learned over the years is the very best leadership doesn't come from the front, it actually comes from the back, or it comes from the middle. And the reason it's the best is because what you're actually doing is you're just keeping an eye on things and you're gently prodding the right people to be having their turn at leading. And they are getting, firstly, they're, they're grateful for the opportunity, they're motivated and inspired by the opportunity, and then they get out there and they perform, and the best of them perform far beyond what they think they can do. And so they're, and far better than what you could have done if you had tried to take on the responsibility that you've actually delegated to them. So I think um, I would utterly endorse the approach that leadership sometimes, but really is from the front, far more frequently is actually about how you activate and motivate those within your team to have their turn at leadership. And man, it is such a nice thing when you have a, a team that is full of leaders performing up to and beyond their own expectations. It makes the job of, of ultimately being the CEO or the, the leader so much quieter and simpler than you can ever imagine. Um, I've talked about the fact a critical component of uh, the leader, and, and Henry said the same thing. You have to be able to paint the picture. You have to be able to paint it with conviction uh, and with simplicity. You've got to be able to communicate in a way people can understand. It is a waste of time communicating in a way that you feel proud of 
and the person or the people who are listening to you or receiving that communication don't have a clue or only get half the picture out of it. So um, a critical component of leadership is be able to tell a story in a simple, understanding, authentic way. Um, there is times when leaders must stand alone, where the sway of opinion, be it public or private or organisational, is going in one direction, but actually you know when you look in your heart of hearts that the answer is not that direction, the answer is in the opposite direction, and you have to be prepared to stand up and uh, take that decision and to take what comes with making that decision. And that's happened a few times to me, and I tell you what, it's, it's a really lonely situation when you're caught there. Um, but as long as your judgment has been sound, and as long as the way in which you, again, deal with the fact that you are making a decision that this is the way we are going, um, then ultimately, uh, as the, the, the uh, wiseness of that decision becomes more apparent to others, you find that, that people uh, come back in very quickly into that and join back in to the team. If, on the other hand, the way in which you deal with it is to say, this is the way we're going, if you don't like it, get out, um, then your chances of recovering from that sort of decision are not necessarily um, uh, good. Um, Henry talked about resilience. Resilience is so important, because you get knocked about all over the show when you are leading. Um, teams, leading teams get knocked about all over the show, right, left and centre. You have to be able to absorb that. You have to be able to understand that it is human nature that others that you are dealing with, trying to lead, um, for one reason or another, are resistant to what you're doing. People don't like change. That's an absolute truth. Doesn't matter if it's, if it's blindingly obvious that change has to occur. People don't like change. I'm a completely different person at home than I am at work. At home, I am utterly and completely resistant to change. Every Saturday morning, I get up, I put on the same pair of shorts, the same T-shirt, and just about wear them the whole weekend. Drives my wife crazy. Don't know how to use a, a, a mobile phone properly, and probably will never learn. Hopelessly resistant. Put me in a work situation, quite different. Uh, I look at things, I'm relaxed about change, and often it's about just helping others relax into and understand it's actually worthwhile keeping going, because what happens is the world's going to keep going anyway. You stay still, thinking you're not changing, you fall so far behind um, that ultimately you're, you're history. Um, Henry Chai, others have said it as well, is the willingness to genuinely listen. Um, not just sit there and be part of a, a passive part of a conversation, um, waiting for it to finish so that you can move on, um, but you've been there physically, so therefore you can tick the box, I was there, they had their say. Um, actually listening to what people are saying, absorbing it, reflecting on it, um, allowing it to influence your thought development as time goes by. You know, most of my brilliant thoughts have not been my thoughts at all. Um, and what they have been is other people making really telling contributions to conversations. And in the middle of the night or on a weekend or on the holidays, suddenly the penny drops and various pieces of that jigsaw puzzle I talked at the start fall into place and suddenly you can see something in your mind's eye in front of you that you know is a solution to something that, that's been on your mind. Um, you only find that because you've actually been prepared to sit there quietly and listen. And I can't tell you how appreciative people are of when they recognise that as part of your normal behaviour, when they know that they are not wasting their time when they sit down with you, when you actually look them in the eye, when you don't look at your watch, when you actually hear what they have to say, when you remember it later, when you feed parts of it back into conversations with them and others later, and, hold, and ultimately then when they can see it influence the outcome of certain things uh, that you've decided to do. 
that's leadership. That's that's so vital is is to how you galvanise a team. A team will not be galvanised unless the members of that team think they are actually part of what is being created, what is being delivered. If they think they're pawns that are simply tools that the leader uses to get to an outcome that the leader wants, then you know that might last for six months, nine months, ten months, three days. Uh, once they recognise it, once they understand that you're not a listener, um, they switch off, you've lost them, and man, re recapturing, you know, again, Henry talked about continuity of staff. You will never have continuity of staff if you can't listen, if you can't respectfully take in and think about what people say. Chris, I think I've run out of time. Yeah, it is. I know. <laughs> no, so I will make a, a graceful exit um, in saying this. Um, leadership, I don't stand here and say I know about leadership. I stand here and tell you about experiences that I've had that influence me. Um, I'm currently in a job that has radically changed some of my views on leadership um, because of the circumstances that I'm in, in a really energising and positive way. It's added to the richness of, of what I understand and know. Stuff that I didn't know two or three years ago, even though I thought I was an experienced leader. You never stop learning, and you shouldn't stop learning, because it is so much fun to actually experience things, to learn and to cope with, and ultimately to successfully adapt to and succeed uh, in an environment that, that project yourself back a few months, a few years, you wouldn't have had a hope in hell because you didn't know anything about. So um, there's no magic answers. There, is, there are basic principles and there is a huge reliance on you developing uh, enough emotional sense um, that you can take advantage of everything that's in front of you, including most importantly the people that you are with in order to fine tune and develop yourself into really effective leaders and really effective team members. Thank you. <laughs>